send my the measurements for the mother, the daughter, the, I just, I was very pleased with myself. <laughs> and uh, I watched the movie several times to get the, uh, so I had models, you know, and I dressed them in these costumes, but the minute I see this little boy, the minute he got this costume on, he started dancing around the room. <laughs> and then later his mother came in and turned on Like some of the other books, I use a whole, they take place at a school, so I use a whole classroom. And uh, I do a presentation for the kids on how picture books are made. And I read them the text, and, uh, and then they act it out. And I take many, many pictures, and then I put it together. I, I mean, I know pretty much what I want on the page before it ends up all popped on a page. But so. Thank you. Hi, my name's Mary Delia, and we are actually being filmed. I've been asked to tell you that um, we are on KALB. If you would like to see a rebroadcast of this, you can go to the cable channel, which is um, KALB, and uh, on Saturday mornings they're going to rebroadcast it. Or you can go to um, YouTube and just put in Albany KALB, and you can see it. So anyway, so yeah, that's that's another wonderful thing about high tech, and we're we're just moving right along with that. So um, I want to tell you first before I introduce today's speaker. Uh, next month we have a woman named Charlotte Biltikoff, who's an associate professor of American Studies and Food Science and Technology at UC Davis, and she's recently written a book called Eating Right in America: The Cultural Politics of Food and Health. Um, she studied the food movement over a 150-year period from, um, you know, the Kellogg's and the Wright movement to, um, to where we are today with organic food and um, sustainable agriculture and that sort of thing. So it should be really interesting. So that's next month. And then in December, we have somebody from the Berkeley Path Wanderers who will be speaking. So that should be good, too, and I'll have those dates for you. But today... We are very lucky indeed to have not only the slides, but the woman and the books, her real books, Lee Lyon. 
Lee is an award-winning children's book illustrator, painting teacher, and portrait artist who's made a childhood dream come true. She drew, um, she'd love to draw as a child. She took art classes, began to paint oils and when she was 12 years old, and when she wanted to be a children's book illustrator when she grew up. So she ended up going in a different direction, college, raising a family, running a small doll and puppet business, then back to school for an MBA and into the corporate world. Wow. And as a marketing project manager. Now, at long last, she is a children's book illustrator with five published picture books, four of which have won awards. Please give your um, a warm welcome to Lee Lyon. Thank you, thank you. Oh, we'll cover it here. So, hello, I am very happy to be here and uh, let you learn some of what I've learned as I have become a children's book illustrator at long last. Um, it's interesting how one has a childhood dream and then often forgets about it. And I, I can't even remember if I got discouraged or I just got busy with life. And about 15 years ago, I, uh, is this okay? 15 years ago, I, I'm always looking at the UC Extension classes and there was one called Illustrating Children's Books. And I thought, wait a minute, I had never seen such a class before. That's what I wanted to be. And so I took the class and now I am one. <laughs> so, so and, and it's a really fascinating field. I've learned a lot. And uh, I also have gotten very involved with the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which is a worldwide organization. There are two national conferences, a uh, worldwide. So I'm going to tell you how a picture book is made. And uh, these are my books. Now, since the color isn't quite right, um, Say Something is the first one I ever did. And I, I've been very lucky. I've, uh, this first book, it's really hard to break in. And a very small publisher in Maine who does social issue children's books liked my art sample and hired me to illustrate this book. This book is about bullying. And this month, they're coming out with a 10 year anniversary edition. This book, sad to say, because it's needed, has sold over 65,000 copies. And it's, it's used largely, you know, I mean, often in schools. So whenever I think, gee, I should be doing something for the world, I remember this and, oh, that many kids are getting inspired. The message is it's not enough just to not be a bully. You have to say something if you see something, if you see injustice. So um, the next book the, the same publisher hired me for is called Playing War. And this is about a group of kids who, uh, it's a hot day, they're playing with a, a friend from, who's moved there from another country. It's obvious that they've, spent the summer together, but they don't, it turns out they don't really know that much about him. And it starts out as too hot for basketball, what should we do today? And someone gets the idea, let's play war. Well, this kid from the Middle East has been in a war, and he eventually tells them why he doesn't want to play war. And it, it's a very interesting discussion starter. And at the end, the kids say, you know, it's too hard for war. Let's play basketball. And they walk off together. So it never says you shouldn't play war, but it shows that war is not a game and that friendship's more important. So as I say, th these books are I really want to talk so much about these each book. But this is... Oh, Operation Marriage is actually the last one. I really have been doing social issue books. This one's about 
Uh, it takes place right before Proposition 8 passed, and a brother and sister talk their two mommies into getting married while they can. And they're saying, oh, we had a commitment ceremony. We don't need to do this. Oh, yes, you do. So they end up, oh, this is, they end up getting married and having a, having a wedding. And so, so I was thrilled to be asked to do that one. That was a local, a local small publisher. It's a wonderful website and organization called Reach and Teach. And they call themselves a peace and social justice learning company. Can't go wrong with that. And then another one was also from Tilbury House, the small publisher. Oh, that's the same one. Um, keep your ear on the ball. And it's about a blind boy, a visually impaired boy, who joins a regular classroom. And they all want to help him. Oh, can I do this for you? Can I? And he keeps saying, thanks, but no thanks. Until it comes to kickball, that's one thing he really has trouble with. They figure out a way how to help him play kickball that he will accept. So, and for this, I found a school. I was saying earlier that I use models, and I, which I will go into more, found a school that had visually impaired children uh, mainstreamed into the regular classrooms with a resource teacher. So I was able to, uh, what am I, I'm looking for a certain picture. I was able to uh, make it real. Oh, that, th there's a picture in here where he's using his braille machine because there really was a braille machine and he got to demonstrate it for the kids while, we, while I was taking pictures. It was really wonderful. And then the last one is the Miracle Jar, which is this Hanukkah book. And I was uh, rented costumes from Fiddler on the Roof for my models for this one. So, but I want to, I want to turn this on. It's red. Hmm. There. So, I'm going to cover briefly little a brief history of picture books then and now and how the illustration has changed largely because of printing processes then some myths and truths about the children's book business there are things that we just always assume and that's not how it works and then a book begins the illustration process my technique and then the the book is printed Oh, wrong direction. Why is this going the wrong direction? Oh, that's, that's the way. I'm pushing the wrong arrow. So here are, is an assortment of picture books through the years, starting with Beatrix Potter. Um, and if, if you haven't seen the movie from a few years ago called Miss, Miss Potter with Renee Zellweger, it is just the most delightful movie about Beatrix Potter. So she had a very classic style and wonderful style, and they're still sell all the time. Make Way for Ducklings is a, uh, a classic. Um, what are some of the other, where the wild things are? You'll notice with Make Way for Ducklings and Peter Rabbit, there's not as much color in them as you see nowadays. I mean, this one down here, is a lot of color. And, and that's because of the printing process. They used to have to do four color separation. The illustrator would have to do all these different you know, versions of an illustration to, to print it in color. And now they just photograph it, scan it. The printing is so much easier that nowadays you can use almost any medium. You could have uh, oil painting, watercolor, collage, digital. As long as they can photograph it or scan it, they can print it, which makes life much easier and makes books more fun, too. However, every once in a while, there's a classic that comes back. This uh, kitten's first full moon. Just a few years ago, it looks like a very old book. It won the Caldecott Award, and it was like five years ago. 
kids still like simple, basic books. Of course, it depends on the, the age of the child. Some are very realistic. Some are very cartoony. Um, some are stylized. Anything goes. And, and t- things tend to come in and out of fashion, too. But, so, so this is a close-up of, of several different designs. It says search inside because I copied it from Amazon, but I can't. Unfortunately, the technology isn't such that I could click on it and search inside. So this is what I was saying, that it's easier to print so we can use more. And children are more sophisticated. However, at bedtime, they still like a kitten book. But even toddlers have so much TV and so much electronics that that's what picture books are competing with. So you have to take that into account, but it shouldn't change our goal, which is to enchant and to teach and to help kids deal with this world of ours. Um, Publishers nowadays, every year, they're getting to be fewer, larger publishers. They're snapping each other up and they're huge corporations. They still, within each big publisher, have separate little, what they call them, imprints that focus on a certain kind of book. So in a way, you can still feel like you're working with a smaller publisher, but between that and what used to be the big the big stores and before Border closed, they were dictating what got published. So, however, so we have to continue and always shop at our independent bookstores, keep those going, you know all that. So here's some myths and truths about how picture books are made. People always think that the author chooses the illustrator, unless they're doing both themselves, which publishers love it if you're good enough to do both the writing and the illustrating. The author should not choose the elevator, elevator illustrator, or the elevator. <laughs> they, uh, the editor wants to choose the illustrator. And so if you are writing a story uh, and submitting a manuscript, which is what they call the, the, the unpublished story, to a publisher, there's more chance of you getting picked up and having that made into a book if you don't choose a friend to illustrate it for you. Um, it looks more professional because you know you obviously know that you're not supposed to choose. And it can get complicated. Sometimes they like the art, they don't like what you wrote. And it really... Besides which, the editor wants to, is like the produ- producer, it wants to put all the pieces together to make this a, a book that will be a winner and will sell. So sometimes if it's a new author, they'll put an experienced, well-known illustrator with that author, or vice versa. And that helps, you know, books sell. And the other thing is that the author and the illustrator do not work together on the book. Often, they don't even meet. It just seems so counterintuitive. But I imagine, I don't think it always was that way either. I think that there were so many problems getting a book finished because the author has one view, the illustrator another, the art director a third, you know. So basically, when you get a, I'm talking because there are more, probably more potential authors in this room than illustrators. If you sell a manuscript to become a children's book, it's really not yours anymore. It's not your baby. And whatever vision for illustrations you had in your mind, you sort of have to let go of them. Because part of the role of an illustrator is to add to the book. Unless it's a very young book where your kids are learning words and you have to have the word match the pictures, the goal of the illustrator is to add a substory to it. Like in, in uh, playing war, well, I had these five kids that were modeling, uh, acting it out for me, and I was taking pictures. 
at the one of the, the little girl's house, and she happened to have a golden retriever. Well, this golden retriever was such a delight, and he was in every picture I snapped. I put him in the book. There's no mention of a dog, but I've also heard so often that kids love to find the cat in each picture or find the dog. So I made sure that this dog was in every picture except the one where you knew he was off of the other kids, you know, so he wouldn't be in this picture. And um, it, it added a little sub-story. So, okay. Um, illustrators, we send art samples to art directors and they keep them on file. When an editor gets a book that needs a certain style of, art, of, of illustration or, you know, a book about a gorilla, oh, so-and-so paints, you know, terrific gorillas. Then they, oh yeah, I know, I have her samples and I look. Uh, one thing I've learned from workshops at these conferences, it's always a good idea to send a postcard size sample because if they love it, they'll stick it on their bulletin board. And then they get a manuscript, and this is what happened apparently with Say Something. I had a picture of a little boy and girl playing um, Little League, you know, chewing the shirt, watching to see if the ball was going to go. And um, it was on the, the editor's bulletin board, and she said, you know, that style might just work for this book. And it was the first, you know, first thing I had ever, first time I ever got hired to illustrate a book. So it was all very exciting. And, you know, so I'm picking up all these tips as, through the years. Um, one thing more and more, publishers will only see manuscripts through an agent. The smaller publishers will still see them, what's called, um, over the transom is one word for it, um, unsolicited manuscripts. Yeah, over the transom, it's like you could just picture dropping it through, and uh, the slush pile is what they call it also when you send. Illustrators can send samples to anybody. You don't have to have an agent. Um, what you have to do, though, is do your research to see which publishing house would ever use your style and would like your style, because as I showed, I mean, I paint rather realistically, and stylized cartoony publishers aren't going to use mine. So, um, oh, another thing, people think that even if, if you all write and illustrate a book and you're going to submit it to be, you know, hopefully purchased, you think you have to paint all the pictures or, col you know, color them? No. Uh, a dummy which I will show later, but a dummy is, it's called a dummy, it's a mock-up of a book so that you can hold it as if it were a book and see what it's like to turn the pages, but black and white drawings and just a few in color so that they know what the finished art will look like. But, you know, most of these are black and white. A few in color just enough so they'll know. And the reason is, no matter how lovely your paintings are, they're gonna wanna change things in the art. They're gonna wanna change what you're showing, the angle. So it's really a waste of effort to paint them all ahead of time, and it doesn't look like you know how the game is played. So I'm giving you all these hints in case you or anybody you know is thinking of uh, trying to break into this. So a book begins. The publisher buys a manuscript from an author who has sent it to them through an agent or not. The editor chooses probably, you know, with the assistance of the art director, who, who would be good to illustrate this. They see if they're available. Contract is signed. It's usually with picture, trade. this is called trade picture books. Uh, mass market picture books are like the door, the explorer, and the, the ones you see at the, I almost said five and dime. There aren't such things anymore at the drugstore. And, you know, trade paperbacks are bookstores and schools and libraries, and they are on royalty basis. 
So there's an advance paid to the author who has already done the work. Of course, they may have to edit. And then an advance paid to the illustrator who has like nine months to a year to illustrate this book. And that advance is against future royalties, a certain percentage per book sold. And so they add up the, once it's on sale, they add up the royalties that you've earned. And once you've met what they gave you already, then you start getting more royalties. If you never meet it, that's okay. They never take the advance back. So, which is handy because, I mean, I was so spoiled with the first book because A, it sold a lot, but B, I had a very small advance because it's a small publisher. So I've been getting royalties. And I didn't realize that very few books sell out, which is what it's called, so that the the advance is met. Okay. Um, so then the editor sends the manuscript to the illustrator. The illustrator, in my experience, I think sometimes the editor or the art director will be more directing in this, but the the illustrator takes this these typed pages and divides it into a book. Makes, you know, it figures out what words will be on which page. Um, there are some rules and guidelines, so you're not just open. They'll, uh, and, and lots of things to keep in mind, which I'll go through. But then, so they'll divide the text, make thumbnails, which I'll show you, then make this dummy, and throughout the process, you know, send it to the editor and work back and forth. You know, now it's so much easier, you can email things. Um, then they finally, the team, it's a team effort, the team, except the author's not included in this team at this stage. They uh, finalize the, the dummy and then paint the spreads. And a spread is the painting. Is it too loud if I do that or is it better? Okay, I keep lowering my head. So, it's not overwhelming as it sounds to divide this, to have full responsible for dividing this in, because there are guidelines. A picture book normally is 32 pages long, and that includes the title page, the dedication page, the copyright page, you know. Um, so this leaves 27 pages or so for pictures. And often the pages are double spreads, which was one big picture across both, you know. So you end up having to do 13 or 14 paintings for a book. And these are some examples. Um, that's a single spread. Now on some things you'd have one picture on the left side and a smaller one on the right. So you would have to do two paintings for that. This is a, a double spread. Things to remember. You know, I'm wondering, should I have questions at the end? or I think at the end. The things to keep in mind, which, it, it's, you know, as an illustrator, I feel like I'm a director uh, and a cameraman. And it's, there's so much similarity with, a movie, with movie making. So I need to have... You need to make it interesting. You need to have variety of perspective, like some views straight on from you know mid distance, some close up, some looking down, some looking up. If it's all the same, it's boring. Now for a very young book, you might want the continuity, but normally you want it to be more interesting. And since I started doing this, I'll, I'll look at movies and all of a sudden I say, oh, we're suddenly looking from the chandelier. I know that trick, you know. <laughs> you really notice the camera angles. Um, you want to put the text in different places on the page. Now, there's a book designer who has the final say about where the text goes. The illustrator sort of makes a, this is what I see, and then they work together. You divide the text and do the illustrations so that the reader wants to turn the page to see what happens next. So you don't you have people facing the right side of the page so to lead your hand over there and you you know the uh cliffhanger or whatever you make you 
really try to do that so that they want to turn the page. And you have to make sure that things are believable and consistent. Consistent more than believable. I mean, it, well, if, if it's a book about magical things, it doesn't have to be believable. But the people and the places have to be recognizable throughout. Um, sometimes, you know, they have to be wearing the same clothes if it's the same day, unless we know that they went home to change, you know, this kind of thing. Sometimes I will flip a photo over because it makes a better composition. I have to move the barrette to the other side so that it's not a reverse image. If, if a kid is, has been right-handed throughout the book and, and it's they doing something that you notice that, you can't have, flip a picture and suddenly have them writing with their left hand. All these things you have to think about and go through and, you know, double check and double check. Um, I remember once seeing, I don't even remember which picture book it was, but it was, it was a really, you know, nicely illustrated book and everything. And in one scene, the father, we were looking down the stairs to the front door of this apartment, which, you know, just had stairs and then the apartment. And he was running up and it was a great angle and great action and his part was on another side from the whole rest of the book. I don't know if a kid would have noticed that, but kids are the first ones to notice changes and mistakes. So, so all these things you have to think about. Um, for the books that took place in school, like the Keep Your Ear on the Ball, I had to, at one point I had to divide the pages and say, okay, this was all on one day. And these three pages were on a different day, and these were on a yet another day, and make sure they're wearing the same clothes for the the same day, and that it's different clothes for the next day so to help the reader realize this is a different day, and just inter- <laughs> you can't put the logos on that are on all the shirts, you know. <laughs> I remember when I was first doing say something, I mentioned to my daughter who works for the Gap. You know, she's an architect at, at Gap Corporate. I said, God, I just realized I have to dress like 80 kids in this book. You know, the kids in the hall. And and she said, you know what you do? You go onto Old Navy and the Gap websites and see what they're showing for the fall. And I was lucky because it was pretty much basic jeans and T-shirts, striped shirts. You want, to, as, I, as I describe to the kids when I'm doing a presentation, you know, before they model, I said, you want it to look like now, but not so much like now that in five years it looks old fashioned. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book, um, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, which Rachel Maddow quotes all the time. It, it, she was a child when it was very popular. <laughs> that book is fabulous and the drawings are wonderful, but you look at that book and boy is it 70s the sideburns the father has and the, the, you know, bell bottoms and stuff. It still works, but you got to be careful, you know. So, so here's some, some more examples of this is sort of a head-on shot with action. Just a, a close-up, sort of a portrait almost. Because normally you don't want kids to be looking at us. They should be interacting with each other. I mean, we're not in the story, but they are. But this, his expression somehow works. Another interesting angle. This is the kickball game that they're helping. Sort of an aerial view, not quite. Close-up. Another angle. This one, to get this one, I went, this was 10 years ago, I went to the um, the Pelican, oh, no, Pyramid Brewery on, on uh, I happened to be there on, on Gilman, and they have, instead of a second story that goes all the way across, it's like half, like a mezzanine. A, yeah, a loft. So I went up there and I was leaning over with my camera, taking pictures of the waiters walking by, the people eating, to get this view, and then I just turned it into, you know, I drew from that and turned it into a cafeteria. And in this scene in Say Something, uh, she's this 
girl, our heroine, has been noticing people getting teased, and she says, oh, but I don't do that. Well, today, her friends, for some reason, are absent, and she's alone at the table, and, and these kids come and start picking on her, and she gets really upset, and... Uh, I don't know if you can really see this, but she wished she could stop crying. She wished she could disappear. And then she realizes that the kids at the next table, who, who are her friends too, too, they didn't do anything. They didn't help her. And she, it's like light bulb. Why didn't they help me? They saw I was in trouble. And so she goes home and tells her brother, her older brother, you know, that she was really mad at these kids at the next table. And he said, well, why are you mad at them? They didn't do anything. And she said, right. And so, yeah, that's why I'm mad at them. So on the, the next day, she sat next to the girl on the bus who always sits alone. And, and the, the words are, on the bus the next day, I sat next to the girl who always sits alone. She's really funny. And I had to make, those were the words, I had to make the picture very clearly mean funny humorous and not funny weird. And uh, I was doing a school visit at a third grade class and I uh, read the book showed them the, the, all the pictures, and then I, the, the, there were questions, and one of the kids said, well, what about all the other kids that she saw that were being teased? You know, she's only helping this one. I said, it's, it's only the next day. Give her a chance. And, and another kid said, oh, I know. That can be your next book. And it can be called, wait, it can be called Say Something Else. <laughs> I thought, you know, from the mouths. Of, anyway, so... This, I am having the time of my life with this. I really am. And I'm using my MBA to make my way into this business. I really am. So thumbnail sketches is the, once you think you like the way you've divided up the words, you can do thumbnail sketches. Um, they can be rough drawings. And you have a blank form that has, you know, 32 pages. So you just are doing little sketches. Um, you don't have to write the text. You just put lines where the words would be. Um, this is a very rough part, you know, part of thumbnails, very rough, just to sort of get the idea of what you want in the book. I am now learning how to make better thumbnails. And uh, I'm learning that the more design work you do at this stage, the less you have to do later. Because really seeing the, the different, um, this way you can sort of see which images are strong and if there's one that isn't, you know, need to tweak that. You can see that some are close up, some are farther away. This is, I'm, I'm taking a a one-on-one -on -one class with, with one of the illustrators whose book was on the front, th that thing of all the books over Skype. He's my hero and we're doing this. We figured out that we didn't have to be in the same town. He gives me an assignment. I do the work. I email it to him and we talk over Skype and he can demonstrate and I can. So this assignment was to take a poem by Robert Frost and divide it into a 32 page picture book. And so I had to find you know, look at a bunch of Robert Frost poems, find one that a child could relate to. And so I chose Gathering Leaves. And so, and I put a boy in it with the father, you know, whatever. Come to realize, as a Californian, I don't know much about raking leaves. So I'm doing research and learning, and he's back east, and he keeps saying, oh, no, it doesn't go that way, you know. People don't use that, so... I'm learning. So then the dummy is, as I showed you, a mock-up of the book, black and white drawings, uh, 
placed on the pages they would be on, and the words are there. Um, there are several ways to physically make this book. It's not a, it doesn't have to be a big production. Um, and this allows the editor to, you know, tactily see what it would be like as a book. And again, black and white, except for a couple of uh, painted ones, so let's see what the final art will look like. So this is from a dummy for, for Keep Your Ear on the Ball. And another one. So these are the models that I used, some of them, for Keep Your Ear on the Ball. As I said, I had this whole class, gave them a talk on how books are made, like this, and uh, I had done the thumbnails so I knew what scenes on each page, you know, basically, and then they acted it out. They had a kickball game for me. It was just, the teachers helped. It was great. So this particular book, Keep Your Ear on the Ball, is a true story about a real person who happened to have medium brown hair and brown eyes and was Caucasian. The, the boy who in the class who was visually impaired is named Mohammed and was not Caucasian. And, uh, you know, being schools here, multiracial, you know, wonderful multiracial variety of kids. So be, only because it was a real person, I couldn't use Muhammad's face as the main character. So, but I used his body for the body language. So, but anyway, but this boy in the middle, I loved the pose of the running, but he also doesn't look like our main character, Davy. So I just put Lawrence's head on this other kid's body and put it on the cover. Um, that boy with the glasses is actually, actually Mohammed. He could see a little bit, but I just put him, because he couldn't be the main character, I made sure that he was in the book as one of the other kids, and I put him in as many pictures as possible, because we're dealing with real kids here. I don't want to hurt feelings. Um, some other. These were some of the, the models in their uh, fig, Fiddler on the Roof costumes for uh, the Hanukkah book, and uh, those are the paintings that I did from them. Granted, the color isn't accurate, but you can look through the books and see. So, how much time do I have before questions? Um, probably about five minutes. Okay. So, the technique that I've sort of developed for how I do this, and um, a lot of it's learning by the seat of my pants, I have just, <laughs> I realized recently that because I've been only dealing with small publishers, I have not gotten to work with an art director. And these editors do what they can to help me, but I've pretty much been on my own, which now I look at these books and think, oh, it could have been so much better if this and this and this, but you would do that anyway. So I go through all the, the photos that I've taken at the photo shoot. Um, I go through them and choose which ones I want to use for which page. Um, some people, in fact, probably most, including my mentor who's teaching me, he decides f definitely what he wants on a page. He hires, you know, the models. He sets it up. He sets the lighting and the costumes and actually has it the way he wants it and takes the picture, makes it a lot easier to paint from. And I suppose that should be my goal. I have so much fun with these kids when, we're mo when they're modeling that I take some pictures like that and then they just play and I take all these other pictures. And so I may use oh, I like this face, and I like that body language, and I put them together, and then I have to create the lighting because the, light, the sun has to be coming from the same side for all of them, and I have to jiggle, which isn't easy. And So I'm probably making more work for myself, but I sure love taking all those pictures and using them. So um, what I do... I mean, sometimes I draw freehand these kids, but I know I can draw them, but it's at this stage when I'm doing so much drawing and putting them together into compositions, I use tracing paper. And I put it over the, the drawing 
the photo and I just do the outline of the person and you know just where the features are and then I scan all the the elements for a painting into Photoshop and I can move them around there and make it make it the way I look the way I like and then anyway that's so that becomes the drawing and I paint from that um, you don't need to know all this detail um, the, the art director if there is one and the editor decide on which will be the cover and all this you know that the gets down to the wire um, and then I paint the spreads and a couple of tricks that I've learned, some I've heard and some one I figured out myself. You should never paint the book from the beginning to the end because your paintings towards the end will be better than the ones at the beginning because you've been practicing. I, a teacher pointed this out and I thought, whoa, of course. Also, do them in a random order. And also, give yourself enough time to paint them over because you'll want to. Some of them work the first time, but some you, th you think you love it and then you do some more and you realize, you know, that one's not up to s these. So you can make the actual, the, the final art, the actual size of the book or larger or smaller as long as it's the same proportions so that it fits. They'll tell you what size, shape book. Um, I am just said that. Email the art to the art director as I'm going, so... Um, so they can give their feedback. Then most publishers, you send the actual paintings to, to be scanned and printed into the book. The last publisher I had for, uh, Operation Marriage, they're very small. They wanted me to get scans done and photos done and send it. So, which helped in a way because... I could do some tweaking on the computer. <laughs> like some of them I decided, you know, I don't really, this painting's so good of the wedding, but the girl's face isn't great. So I painted it over and stuck it in. The, the author, towards the end of the whole process, emailed me and said, Lee, I was hoping you were going to put my cat in the book because the cat was at the photo shoot. And I'm thinking, now you tell me. But because I was not sending the original art, I, was, I said, send me some photos of the cat. And I painted some little pictures of the cat and put them in in Photoshop. That if it had been oils that I was using, I could have painted a cat in. But with watercolor, you can't put light over dark. So I couldn't and without doing the whole thing over. So, um, And then they make high digital resolution, digital images, um, Oh, the reason it has to be 32 pages, and we're just about finished, is because they do sheets of uh, eight up. You know, big sheet with eight, Im eight pages on a sheet. So whatever it is, they want it to be mul multiples of eight. And some books are 40 or 48 pages, but there has to be a good reason because that costs more. So most picture books are 32 pages. The picture, the printer binds the pages into the books, makes the jackets, everything. Before, first they send what, in, in this field is called an FNG, which means folded and gathered. Uh, I think it's the same thing as a galley, which you hear. And that's the printed book without the cardboard and the cover, basically. It's not sewn together. The, pic the pictures are all in order, folded with this, book cover on it and this is what they send to reviewers to you know it's their sales tool to us to see it for the first time and uh and then orders are filled and hopefully the book sells nowadays unless it's a real big seller you have to do a lot of help on the marketing yourself and uh school visits going to local bookstores to sign. And I've discovered that even Barnes & Noble really likes local artists and, and uh, writers and likes them to come in. Presentations and conferences, which I do, and getting involved with the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. So then the book is real, and having it in your hands finally, 
especially the first book, is like such a rush. And even more so is seeing it on the shelf at the bookstore and seeing it at the library, seeing a child read it, reading it to a child, sharing it with the models. For each of my books, when the book came out, which was like almost a, a, like a year later, had them all over for dinner and gave them the books. We signed each other's books, you know. And one of the little boys in Playing War, his mother told me that ever since the photo shoot, he'd been going to meeting new people. He'd say, hi, I'm Matthew. I'm in a book. And I went, yes. So that's my presentation. And I hope we have time for questions, because I could answer lots of questions. Thank you. Yes. Theme and topic, that's a good question. In your portfolio, you also have a portfolio which has like 10 to 15 images. Um, never the original, you never send the originals. It's always a copy. And you're gonna wanna show, you're gonna wanna show an image that shows what you can do. And especially if it's just one image, like a postcard, you want to make it have kids in it, have human interaction, have a setting. You want it to tell a story, and it doesn't matter what story, as long as it's appropriate for a children's book. Um, I find lately, I do, I get lazy about backgrounds. I so much prefer painting people that I don't, in my promo pieces, I don't do enough of a, of a setting. I don't elaborate on, you know, one, an art director once told me, you know, in this kid's bedroom, the nightstand is another character. You know, make it a specific nightstand. Don't make it humorous, but, you know, make it real. Don't have it generic. You know, you have this wonderful kid, don't have her in a generic room, and all these things to think about. So, and, and at a conference, I think he's the same one, he said, sometimes an image that would be fabulous for the middle of a book isn't such a great sample to send by itself because you sort of need to know what happened to, to appreciate this image. So that kind of thing. But, um, you know, the main thing to do is look at a lot of picture books and uh, see, <laughs> you would think at the library, but the bookstores show what's being purchased now and uh, what styles and things. But so basically you want to tell a story. In your portfolio you want to show that you can do like indoor and outdoor and maybe animals if you like animals and people and show enough of a variety that you want to look like you really are in charge of your material and your storytelling and it takes time. Yeah. For the drawings or the paintings? My paintings, um, I usually, for these double spreads, I use a half sheet. Uh, it's uh, 20, 15 by 20, 15 by 22. A whole sheet is, 20, is uh, 22 by 30, a whole sheet of watercolor paper. And I cut it in half and mark off I do, I like to paint bigger than the book because I paint loosely. So I just make sure that it's the d proportions that will shrink to the right size. And But any size works. Yes? Well, you mentioned that, um, that publishers will have an author with a, with a story in the image book and then they'll, through their knowledge of the uh, illustrator, they will go ahead and sign an illustrator. Yes. Oh, that's an idea. Huh. I could, I could, you know, I could see that happening, especially if you already have a relationship with an editor or an art director, and you do some, you know, like develop a new character or something, and, and they say, oh, that's got to be a book. And if you don't write also, maybe they would say, gee, I wonder if so-and-so could, could do that. I haven't heard that specifically, but 
if you they love it if you are equally good at writing and illustrating and you can do the the thing together because for no other reason that they have to work with only one person <laughs> and not two different opinions but you know which words to leave out of the text because of what you're putting in the illustration and this kind of thing. Yes. Do you have any suggestions for um, where, who is the Dakota Brush Nurse? Her drawing, uh, watercolor, and oil? Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, well, I teach watercolor. I teach watercolor, and... Um, I will think on it. I, give me your information. I can email you. Richmond Art Studio. Oh, right. Rich, yeah. Richmond Art Studio Center. Art Center. The, also the, um, well, I'm taking a figure drawing class at the College of, uh, Contra Costa College. That is phenomenal. Um, they have painting classes there, too. I don't think you have to be an enrolled student uh, the class I'm taking was for seniors, and it used to be free, but now the budget's cut, so, yeah. I was just, um, when you were talking about the uh, nightstand, and the importance of the nightstand and the, and the little girl room, I was, it reminded me that when um, I used to read this Alfie, the Alfie books, my daughter Alfie wanted to make one of these. Uh -huh. Here's the name of these. And uh -huh. I loved those books so much, I wanted that house. Oh. I Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it really does. I don't know if any of you have heard of this book called The Seven Silly Eaters. If you haven't, check it out at the library. It's a, Marla Frazee is the illustrator, and she, this family has like first one kid, then a second, and, and each one will only eat one thing, you know? I mean, they're all picky eaters. But she created this house that they live in and this yard and the, the it's such a family, such a unique family. And there's one image that I love. The mother is sitting there playing the cello next to a basket of laundry that needs folding. <laughs> And I thought, yes, and I met, and and also she wore red hot red high top tennis shoes, and I had occasion. I had met this illustrator at the conference. In fact, she did my first portfolio critique, and I was asking, I was on the phone with her for something, and I asked her. I told her I love that, and she said, well, when. I never could do that when my boys were little. I was going to have her do it, you know, even though her kids were little. And, uh, and she said, yeah, I love red high tops. She said, my next book is about Santa Claus. Wait for it. He's wearing red high tops. So they have fun. It's just really. But that's a good book. To, to, in fact, I should look at it again to refresh my memory of how to make the setting a character. And Yes. Yes. In fact, I just realized I haven't been repeating the question. Simultaneous submissions uh, pretty much nowadays are allowed because that means sending it to more than one publisher at the same time. It used to be that you had to, that e each one wanted an exclusive first, and then after a certain number of weeks or months, you could send it to other people. Nowadays, they are all short, so short-staffed that you don't hear anything for three, four, five months. And it's just not fair to not allow multiple submissions. So they pretty much do, but they want you to mention it in the cover letter. I'm also submitting this to so-and-so. I don't know if you have to say who, but that you are submitting it to other people. Um, one sec, there was something that I was going to... Oh, and some of them are, it used to be you'd get a nice form letter, thanks but no thanks, you know, we read your manuscript, it's very nice, but not for our list, the, the list being the books for the next season, you know. And some of them now, they just say, you'll only hear from us if we're interested. So you have to send to multiple places, so. 
Wait, you had a question over here. That's a good question. I don't know that much about it, but I'm sure you could research it. And I do know the name of an agent. I met her at a conference and she mainly, she's here, but she mainly works with foreign publishers. So if you gave me your card, if you want that information, I could, I don't remember her name, but I could look it up. The question was foreign publishers, um, does, does it work the same way, and is it worth it to try to submit to foreign publishers? And y you had a question back there. And I'll tell you, that's one thing that never happens. If it's a reputable publisher, I, I hear over and over again, that's something you don't have to worry about, is them stealing it. Um, it's as hard to get an agent as it is to get a publisher nowadays. So if a publisher, it, it's a toss-up. I mean, some people swear by um, agents and some say, no, I don't, I don't have an agent for what I've done. Um, but I'm an illustrator. Uh, so... But you have to, you know, you have to look at the guidelines for each publisher, and it's online now, so it's easy to find. And some say will only will not accept unsolicited manuscripts, which means you need to have an agent, or they had to ha have requested it. Sometimes, if you, uh, one thing that helps these SCBWI is the so Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and it's a stupid acronym that you can't pronounce, but the conferences, there are local conferences, and you learn so much, but also if an edit, one of the, the real benefits, if an editor is speaking at a conference, even if they, she normally will only go through an agent, she will offer the, the, the attendees of the conference a window of three months or something that they can submit a manuscript directly and just put, you know, on the envelope, she'll tell you what to put, you know, such and such conference. So that's a good way, and a good way to meet editors. And and if you have a critique of a book at a conference and they say, why don't you fix this and I'd like to see it again, then of course you can send it without an agent. Yeah. Yes, they do. Right. Yeah, that's good. thank you for mentioning that. Book Passage has a three or four day uh, book children's book writers and illustrators conference every year, and it's you know numerous speakers, and we have such a wealth of talent and published people around here. Um, so that's a good one. Yes. Um, for illustrators, every September, I'm the illustrator coordinator, even though I live in the East Bay, for the San Francisco and the Peninsula area. And so I just, at the end of September, we had our seventh annual SCBWI San Francisco Illustrator Day that I organized. And between the respect that this organization has in the industry, and the fact that it's San Francisco and we're paying their flight and hotel, just about everybody I invite to come speak says yes. The only person who hasn't said yes was Brian Selznick, who did Hugo, and the only reason he said he couldn't is because he had decided, this year I've got to finish this book, I'm not doing any conferences. So I've gotten to meet all these really interesting and important people, and it's you know it's just great, and so much of this business is geared towards authors, not illustrators. That it's really nice to have a whole day conference just for illustrators. And I ended up having eighty illustrators come because I sort of the Bay Bay Area is pretty big, so people came from Sacramento, from East Bay, you know. But it's really fun, so.
Any other questions? Okay. Did you have one? Well, she had one already. Oh, okay. I was wondering if you're, if you're making a portfolio and you're doing other spreadsheets, should you try to keep all in the similar style or different like a variety? Good question. In your portfolio, should you keep a similar style or show the variety of styles you can do? They pretty much say try to keep it similar. What you might do is have the styles that you do in painting and then also show some black and white work because for books for older kids like middle grade which is um what fourth fifth sixth grade the illustrations in the book that are just like at the the head of each chapter those are black and white so it's good to show that you can do that because that's another way to get business if you have two styles that you really like doing and are equally you know efficient at put them in two groups don't have them interspersed um but i've heard also if you have some you know a variety of styles just know that the one they'll choose is the one you le you least like to do and you'll get stuck working in it for a year so be careful what you wish for so I have cards and I'm happy to answer questions. I like to promote this business. So I'm happy to answer questions. So feel free to, uh, to uh, email me. And my website is www.leelion.com. That's L-E-A-L-Y-O-N.com. And uh, you're welcome. Thank you so much.